we get here to make sure that we know who's here and who isn't. So why don't we do that? So I'll call to order the regular meeting of the Council of Mayors Executive Committee for April 20th, 2021. And the first thing we need to do is have a roll call. Okay. So I see on the call President Brady. Yes, here. President Darch. Yes, here. President Einhorn. Yep. President Gallagher. Here. President Hayes. I'm here. President Werner. Yes. And then, of course, Mayor Schelke. Um, are there any other members on the line who I missed? Hmm. Well, what, what's that number that we got here as far as? That was seven, seven total numbers. But only five councils. Right. Mayor Schilke, um, can I suggest somebody send the link to the meeting or to the go to meeting business directly to the members who are missing? Sometimes I'm a techno not you know never know what i'm doing and it helps at the last minute on some of the meetings i've been on when people get that um they can easily get in so just thinking i think that's a great idea can can somebody try to do that for us we'll work on it now mayor okay well aaron then let's let's I'll, I'll change the agenda a little bit and and let you under our guess, agenda changes and announcements to uh, give your little spiel Great, thank you. Um, glad to be here this morning with all of you. Um, I know many of you have been paying a lot of attention to the American Rescue Plan that was passed last month. I just wanted to provide just a few brief uh, bulleted priorities um, that I shared with our board last week when we met. So, you know, in addition to the $30 billion in transit operating assistance, the bill includes $350 billion in emergency uh, state and local aid. Um, including 195 billion to states and 130 billion to counties, cities, and towns. Um, something that we were encouraged to see, and I know many of our associations and your associations were also encouraged to see here. Um, you know, the the bill, but we believe that will the funding will be uh, distributed in two different tranches here. So the first um, first sort of segment will be paid in early May, and the second will be about a year later. States will receive at least 100 million through the coronavirus capital projects funds for critical capital projects related to work, education, and health monitoring. Um, but we're still awaiting further guidance from the Treasury Department on what the actual eligibility will be. So access to that funding should be set up by early May, and we will share more details as we have them. And you know, I know as well you'll be getting information from you know the municipal league and other the mayor's caucus and other associations that you're a part of. But, just wanted to highlight three additional funding opportunities that you may or may not have heard about that were included there. There will be a new $500 million low income household water assistance program that will be administered by the state um, and $28 billion in restaurant revitalization funds that restaurants will be able to apply for through the small business advice, small business administration. Um, as well as $50 million in environmental protection agency environmental justice grants to minority and low income communities. So we'll continue to monitor the bills and have our analysis ready to share with you in the coming weeks here. I also shared with the board that um, this is about the time of year when I conduct my annual congressional meetings with our delegation. Typically we'd be in DC, but we've had um, good, good interest and engagement virtually. So that's one area while I say this virtual world has been a positive. I've, I, you know, oftentimes we talk to um, staffers, but we've had a good opportunity to meet with um, our senators and congressional representation representatives uh, face to face via Zoom. Um, you know, again, one of the things that I wanted to impress upon them is the really the importance of the next infrastructure bill, which expires in September, um, and continue to highlight the good work that uh, is done through our committees and our board um, on transportation, on climate, and regional economic competitiveness. The other thing that I know many of you have been um, asking about and are interested in probably is the member designated projects. So we have also used these meetings to talk with our delegation and their staffs about their member designated projects or transportation specific earmarks. 
Um, so as a requirement, these projects are included, must be included in the TIP or the STIP or um, be shown that they can get into the STIP or the TIP. Uh, the, the TIP is their transportation improvement program. Um, we got a lot of questions. We've held a number of Q&A sessions and one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations with staffers about what that means. I mean, I think essentially the big takeaway here is that instead of looking at projects that maybe would spend those funds that were out in some future year, really the, the goal here of this uh, member designated projects or earmarks um, is to get these projects moving and spend those dollars in the next three to four year time frame here. So our role has been to help those uh, our uh, congressional represent representatives' offices understand what's currently in the TIP, how those projects get in there, what the transportation process is, is in, in our CMAP region, because it's different across the country, but it's been a good opportunity to get them up to speed on a number of things that I know that you care about. Just a couple other notes here um, was that we also submitted a grant for CMAP um, for a million dollars. Um, to develop a regional infrastructure accelerated program. So the Build America Bureau of the US Department of Transportation has this innovative project delivery arm. Um, we're hopeful that we submitted a competitive proposal here, but essentially what it would do is help our region build capacity around delivering projects in, in new ways. So other states are doing things like bridge bundling, we think there's an opportunity for us to see some efficiencies of scale if we were to look at our projects that are included in the TIP and be able to deliver those faster um, with greater financial savings to the region. So therefore we could do more with our money. Um, we received letters of support from all seven counties, from Senator Durbin and Senator Duckworth and Representative Newman. So um, we will keep you posted if that comes to fruition. Um, lastly, on our work here is that we released a couple weeks ago a new report showing how transportation fines, fares, and fees impact residents with low income and people of color across our region. And I think just uh, wanted to leave you with one note here is that, you know, it's not surprising that residents with low income spend more money on their transportation costs, um, but one of the things that would help us be able to reduce that is by making sure that there are accessible multimodal trans transit options, bicycle and pedestrian options that actually get people to the places that they need to go. Um, so happy to talk with you or your staffs further about that if you're of interest and there's opportunity for us to think about how we might do things differently, um, please let me know. And then just last note, I know Mayor Schilke always is interested when we're getting back into the office. Um, we have developed our, our plans, our tentative plans, and should the numbers continue to stay where they are, and should vaccination rates continue to grow, you know, we will continue to follow the governor's orders. Uh, Cook County, where you know, our office is in the city of Chicago, so we have to sort of look at, through all of those lenses here. But this summer, we're going to start allowing staff to work voluntarily from the office, um, as long as they're uh, social distancing, wearing masks, we'll keep a 30% um, capacity limit over the summer. But we have a target date of September 7th, um, when we will start transitioning to work from the office. And we'll be asking staff to work from the office 10 days uh, per month um, on alternating schedules here. So even in September, we're still at the moment planning for 50% capacity in terms of our office, just because you know we wanna make sure that we are uh, prepared and, and protecting our staff and, and partners um, moving forward. So our priority is really keeping everyone safe. And so if we get new news or if things change, we have you know been adjustable or uh, flexible people. So that's that's our plan for now. Thanks for the time. I'm happy to answer any questions about anything I covered or anything else that you're interested in. Any questions of our executive director? Well, I, you know, I would just churn in that I, I know this is a point of great conversation amongst all the mayors and village presidents as to, you know, when we can kind of try to open things up and almost every city and village out there has got some sort of summer celebration that they traditionally do or activity or groundbreaking or whatever they always try to do every some have some very unique things and it's become somewhat problematic to almost everybody in the region as to can we or can't we or how many people can we have and how distance do they have to be and so uh this this continues to be a i'll call it a plague on us from a political perspective because we we really don't know what the answers are and I don't think any village president or mayor out there wants to misstep on this one and suddenly have somebody say, well, you had this event and 40 people are now homesick with 
uh, the, the the epidemic. So uh, you know, it's a it's a very cautious one, and uh, I appreciate the way that uh, specifically the CMAP leadership has been trying to keep us all aware and alert and informed as to how things go on. And I appreciate all the good efforts you've made to kind of educate us all and send out notices about what the latest word is and everything else, because this is kind of a government by the seat of its pants here to some degree. And so uh, I guess we're getting through it, but this has been a, a time unlike any others that's ever been done. And, uh, you know, hopefully we're, we're making some records of what we're doing here because, uh, you know, maybe a hundred years from now, the regional face similar situation. It'd be nice if there's a document that they can go to and say, well, what did they do in 2020 and 2021 uh, when they couldn't have meetings or they, they couldn't meet at the office or whatever was going on? And I'm sure this is going to be remembered as a significant part of our history. So uh, I guess we're living in history at the moment and we're kind of making it ourselves. But uh, thanks to CMAP, I don't think we've made a lot of missteps as far as where we are or are not going. And uh, we're just trying to be good stewards of everybody's health and move, trying to move the region forward at the same time. So I think we've, between the Aaron and myself, we've done a lot of talking here and hopefully we've maybe picked up enough that we can maybe go ahead and have the meeting. But uh, I've been sent a, a whole thing to read here to begin the meeting. So let me go through that and then maybe we'll see where we're at. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting of the executive committee to order as permitted by the governor's disaster declaration of January 8, 2021. The determination has been made that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent for this committee. To ensure that the meeting is as transparent as possible, we will post the meeting materials approximately one week in advance, provide a recording of this meeting linked to our website, and we'll take all votes by roll call. CMAP staff will read the names of members that are signed in and then ask them or any other committee members that may be be your present who have missed. Uh, agenda changes and announcements. If there are no agenda changes, uh, we'll move to announcements. The meeting will be recorded. And Jared, can you please confirm that the recording has begun? Uh, make sure that your full name and go to is in go to the meeting. You can edit your name by going to the top corner of the screen and click the on to meeting edit name. Please use the mute function throughout to, to go to the meeting on your, on your phone. This will help eliminate excessive background noise. Those on the phone can also press star six to mute and unmute themselves. You are welcome to turn on your cameras for now. Once we begin the presentations, please uh, turn your cameras off unless you are presenting. Uh, if you have any questions during the meeting, please use the chat box, which the staff will be monitoring. When making a motion, please include your name so the staff can properly record it. First, I would like to thank our outgoing members for their service to their municipalities and to this community. Those include Mayor Williams of Linwood, served three terms as mayor and 10 years prior as a village trustee, and has served as the second vice chair of the executive committee since May of 2013. Mayor Howland of Frankfurt served four terms as mayor and six years as a village trustee. President Levin from Glencoe served eight years as president and four years as a trustee. Mayor Spandy of Winfield served as president for eight years and two years as a trustee. President Newmaker from Fox River Grove served 12 years as president for his service. And again, our heartfelt thanks goes to all these folks for their service to the region. With their departures, there are several committee positions to be filled. Notably, we need a second vice chairman. We also need representatives for the STP Project Selection Committee, the CMAP Project Selection Committee, and the UWP Committee. Each of these committees meet as scheduled typically six to eight times a year. Although we are in the, the virtual world now, this may not be the case in the future for committee meetings which would be held at CMAP's downtown office. Since we are going to have new members at the next meeting, there is time to think about these positions. Perhaps some of the new members may be interested in serving in some capacity. As mayors and presidents of our individual municipalities, we always have our community's interest in mind. These positions will need to look to transportation planning, programming, and policy 
is through a regional lens with a regional vision. We understand that we can sit on various committees and we can represent all 11 council's needs. Uh, and so I guess that's what I'm supposed to read to begin with. Uh, going to item number three, uh, I will it's approval of the minutes from the January 19, 2021 meeting. I will entertain a motion for the approval of the January 19, 2021 meetings. Please remember to unmute yourself and state your name prior to, prior to making a motion. Do I have a motion and second? Mayor Shelke, it's Terry. Um, we still only have uh, five councils represented. So my suggestion would be to not do the minutes at this meeting, but we'll do them at the next meeting. And right. uh, or if we have more members join, uh, we can do that under uh, other business at the end of the meeting. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, okay, we've already had Erin's done her uh, CMAP update, so we'll go to item five, which is the STP Project Selection Committee update. Tama? Good morning, everyone. Um, the STP Project Selection Committee last met on April 1st. At that meeting, staff gave an overview of the applications received in the recent call for STP Shared Fund Projects. Since that call for projects also included CMAP and locally programmed TAP funding, I'm going to give a brief update on all three of those this morning. Um, in total, we received 121 applications requesting over $1.7 billion in federal funding for projects that actually have a total value of over 3 billion. Uh, 61 applicants requested consideration for the SCP shared fund. The applications included projects located within 65 different municipalities from 41 unique project sponsors, which included municipalities, counties, the city of Chicago and all three transit agencies. Road reconstruction and road expansion were the most requested project types, followed by bicycle pedestrian barrier elimination projects, but we did receive applications for all nine of the project types. Um, 72 applicants requested consideration for CMAC funding. These applications included projects located within 73 different municipalities from 30 unique sponsors, again, including municipalities, counties, the city of Chicago, the transit agencies, and also IDOT. Uh, bicycle facilities were the most requested project type, followed by intersection improvements and signal interconnects. 30 applicants requested consideration for TAP funding. These applications included projects located within 33 different municipalities from 19 unique sponsors. Only bicycle facility projects are eligible for TAP funding, and all of the TAP applications will also be considered for CMAC funding, and some which are bicycle and pedestrian barrier elimination projects will also be considered for the STP shared fund. Um, right now, staff is in the process of evaluating the applications and doing all of the scoring, and we expect to present staff recommended programs of projects to the respective project selection committees on July 1st. Um, shifting gears just for a moment to the current STP programs, uh, through the beginning of this month, $25 million in STP shared funds have been obligated and 40 million in your council's STP local programs have been obligated. Between both of those uh, programs, there's about 150 million more in project phases that are targeting obligation through the end of September. So those are the STP updates for this morning. Uh, if there are any questions about the call for projects or the current status of the STP programs, I'd be happy to answer those. Do we have any questions at Cama? I guess not. So thank you. Okay, uh, moving to item six, which is the IDOT Bureau of Roads update. Chad Riddle, is Chad with us? About that, I, I did actually got pushed on the agenda. Sorry, I just got on. I had another call I got off of about two minutes ago. Um, I really don't have an update uh, other than it's business as usual. Uh, staff is back in the building one day a week, still working remote four days a week. Um, we're moving ahead with lettings. Uh, lettings have been picking up uh, the, the June and July. We are losing a couple because of right away and some other issues, but we are still moving ahead with those plans. Uh, and that's really all I have. It's I appreciate the help and cooperation we're getting from the local agencies and the PLs to make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed so we can get these on the lettings and get these agreements through the process. And uh, I'll defer to any questions or comments that people may have for me. 
Any questions or comments for IDOT or Chad Riddle? Thank All you. Quiet on the Western Front. <laughs> Chad, I just as chairman would like to say that, uh, you know, again, I would like to express our appreciation to IDOT and Bureau of Local Roads for your, your, your so willing to connect to us and communicate with us and hear what everybody's got to say. Uh, and I appreciate the good hands-on approach that you take over there. And I appreciate the good work that IDOT is doing to uh, kind of keep things moving at, at this kind of challenging time in the history of the region. So. Appreciate the good efforts and uh, my hat off to you for a nice job. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Put that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, okay, then let's move to seven, which is the GARE membership overview, and that's going to be handled by the CMAP staff. Does somebody at CMAP know we're going to do this? Is the diversity, equity, and inclusion at CMAP? Good morning. Um, thank you, Mayor Schilke. This is Jane Grover. I direct the agency's public engagement. Uh, thank you to our council staff and uh, Aaron and Terry, Jared and Mary. Um, I'm here with here virtually with two of my colleagues, our HR director, Tony Murrell and Ryan Tomto to update you on CMAP's work on several fronts to offer resources to our colleagues so that we can advance equity both within the agency and in our work with regional partners. Uh, my colleagues Tony and Ryan will help me present on those initiatives, including CMAP's membership in the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. Next slide, please. So CMAP has some uh, internal working groups uh, that have been around in the case of the Diversity Inclusion Working Group uh, for several years. The Diversity Inclusion Working Group began several years ago as a place for employees to explore the dimensions of diversity equity and inclusion at CMAP and to learn from each other. And last year, our colleagues of color at CMAP began an affinity, an, aff, an affinity group to continue those conversations with each other. That's our employee resource group. Uh, my colleague, Tony Merrill, again, our human resources director, whom you will hear from next, started an employee commit, committee to build resources and to begin activities to welcome new employees and to support an inclusive culture at CMAP. That's our well map committee and CMAP's appreciation team this is an idea planted by our chief of staff Amy McEwen has been working on building an inclusive culture of appreciation at CMAP since 2019. Um, the A team will soon announce our public service recognition awards at the end of the month and this would be our second year for our public service recognition awards. Next slide please. Thank you. In addition to uh, programs that our employee-led diversity inclusion working group has started. Our executive leadership has also put in motion a series of quarterly diversity, equity, and inclusion workshops to all employees, for all employees. Last July, for example, we studied how to disrupt anti-Black racism. And in November, we went a step further in our agency DEI journey to explore building an organizational culture and climate of race equity. And in March, we focused on LGBTQIA affirming best practices. The goals of these workshops are to develop a common language, explore best practices, and embed that language and those practices in the agency's work. Uh, Tony Murrell has more to share about what's next for CMAP. Good morning, everyone. So what does the future look like in terms of DEI initiatives? Uh, we will be continuing on our DEI training. Uh, our goal is to create a more diverse and inclusive working environment for everyone, including persons with disabilities. Uh, when we think of disabilities, we often think of those that we're more familiar with, like persons with visual impairments, uh, hearing impairments, or physical impairments. But there are so many more kinds of disabilities. As a matter of fact, Statistics show that one out of every four people in the United States struggles with at least one disability. So to that end, we've contracted with an outside vendor to come in and provide some training for staff. This particular vendor, uh, their mission is to create opportunities for those with all kinds of disabilities. Um, so we, we would hope that staff would take away from this training an increased awareness of the uh, challenges that uh, persons with disabilities face uh, to give us an, an understanding of any negative perceptions and also to learn practical action steps 
on how to include people with disabilities in our workplace. Uh, with regard to the roadmap, every journey has a starting point. So we will be uh, working with a, a vendor to help us look at our current state. Uh, that means we will look at statistics, we will look at our policies, our practices, and our goals to determine where we are currently. And also with, with help from um, CMAP staff, input from CMAP staff. Then based on that information, uh, the plan is to develop a and define a strategy in terms of where we will need to go and how we will get there uh, on our DEI journey. Most importantly though, since this is not meant to be sort of a, a check the box kind of initiative, it needs to be sustainable. So that will require a continual review of our, our practices and our policies and metrics and ongoing education uh, to make sure that we are being inclusive uh, to all of the individuals at CMAP. And with that, I will kick it to Ryan Tonto. Great, good morning. Um, uh, as Jane mentioned earlier, my name is Ryan Tomto. I'm a senior policy analyst uh, in the Plan Implementation and Legislative Affairs Division of CMAP. Uh, last year, CMAP joined GARE, uh, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. Uh, so for the next, the next two slides, uh, I'm gonna provide an overview of some of the benefits that come with that membership. Uh, GARE is a national network of government working to achieve racial equity and advance opportunities for all. The Alliance is a joint project of Race Forward and the Othering and Belonging Institute based out of Berkeley. Uh, GARE is, a, is predicated on the idea that government at the local, regional, state, and federal level has played a role in creating and maintaining uh, racial inequities. Therefore, it is the responsibility of government at all levels to advance equity through systemic change. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, there, are, there are a multitude of benefits that come with GEAR membership. In addition to being a part of a peer-to-peer -peer network, members have access to training and facilitation from GEAR and its technical assistance group. Uh, resources that support peer-to-peer -peer connections, uh, specific tools such as uh, racial equity scorecard and results-based accountability software. Uh, it also uh, includes support on the development of new policies and implementation of best practices. Uh, so I want to take a little bit of time to discuss the fourth and uh, fifth bullet points on this slide uh, a bit more in detail. GEAR provides numerous training opportunities, including uh, intensive capacity building training for governments interested in advancing racial equity by addressing institutional and structural racism. Uh, prior to working at CMAP, I worked at the Puget Sound Regional Council, which is the MPO based out of um, Seattle, uh, and it's, a, uh, it's the MPO for the Seattle-Tacoma region. PSRC uh, is also a member of GARE, and during my time there, I participated in GARE's learning cohort, uh, where teams from government jurisdictions made a year-long commitment uh, to a learning process that included six in-person skill building sessions, uh, homework that you did between sessions, and uh, three online peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. During this time, staff from PSRC had uh, learned alongside staff from the cities and counties from around the region. The training provided an excellent opportunity for us to network with those jurisdictions, uh, grow a shared understanding of equity, and think through the opportunities and challenges facing the region uh, together. That experience helped launch initiatives such as a regional equity strategy and an annual regional equity symposium that aims to bring building, that aims to keep building upon that momentum uh, for regional collaboration on equity. Uh, I, I also want to provide a bit more detail on that last bullet point, access to GEAR portal and resources. The, the portal is the main hub of GEAR's communication resources. As we will see on the next slide, uh, GEAR provides various resources to aid jurisdictions in their equity work. Uh, within the GEAR portal, there are region and subject area working groups that members can join to dig into racial equity in the context of those specific regions or subject areas. Uh, uh, subject areas can include things like transportation, environmental justice and sustainability, procurement, parks and recreation, public health, as well as many others. Uh, the GEAR portal has an extensive library of equity-related webinars. Members can participate in those webinars live, um, but they're also recorded and posted to the portal for members to view whenever it's most convenient for them. The portal also includes numerous tools, such as the ones shown here at the bottom. Uh, they include resources like the Racial Equity Toolkit, Racial Equity Action Plans, opportunities for advancing racial equity in government, um, and contracting for equity. 
they also provide organizational assessments with information and tools needed to advance racial equity more strategically and systemically within go local government. Uh, GEAR membership uh, includes many, many more benefits than we have time to discuss here, but if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to visit uh, the racial equity alliance.org or reach out to us here at CMAP and we'll be happy to uh, connect you with more information. Uh, and with that, I will hand it back over to Jane, who will share some uh, equity related projects we have going on here at CMAP. Uh, thank you, Tony and Ryan. Uh, while we undertake these activities within our organization, we have also looked for opportunities to embed equity in our external projects. Let me highlight a few. Uh, last year, we developed and shared a data tool to support Equitable CARES Act funding for Cook County, guiding the distribution of funding to where it was needed. We piloted a change in the criteria we used to determine funding allocations. As you well know, uh, in our STP transportation program that resulted in more applications from communities in our region's economically disconnected areas and more successful applications, translating to more of that transportation funding going to where it is needed. As Erin mentioned in her remarks, this month we published a report on inequity in our regional transportation fees, fines, and fares with important recommendations to reduce the burden on our lower income residents. And finally, we just kicked off a project to operationalize equity in our public engagement initiatives. Ryan is leading that project. Uh, so thank you to Tony and Ryan. Thank you to our slide advancer, whoever you are. And we are glad to provide you with more information about any of these things. Our work is ongoing and we look forward to the opportunity to update you on these activities. Thank you, Mayor Schilke. I miss you, Mayor Schilke. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I think this was an important presentation to have today because, I mean, this is really coming into action throughout the region. And I've had several questions about, you know, where GARE is at and how do we contact them and, you know, where we find information. So this is good to share with the region. I appreciate the good efforts. You're kind of pioneering a, a new idea here. And I think it's one that probably at the end of the day will well serve the region. So thank you for everything you're doing. Okay, new into eight is a uh, summary of COVID-19's economic impacts on Northeastern Illinois, and Austin Edwards is gonna do that. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for letting me join you today. As you are well aware, we passed a momentous anniversary last month with one year from the beginning of most restrictions and closures due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it gave us an opportunity to think about where COVID-19 has most impacted our region and some of the signs of initial recovery. As you may have also heard, CMAP is leading a regional economic recovery task force, thinking about some of the strategies that would allow us to get more people and places back online as public health conditions improve. So what I wanna to do today is briefly summarize the COVID-19 economic impacts as we see them, and again, some of the initial signs of recovery. It's been a few weeks since we finished this analysis, so some of the numbers will have changed, but we wouldn't expect to see vast improvements from, from what I'm about to show you. There's also a lot of data in this presentation, so I really encourage you to go and look at the memo that was linked on the committee page, and I'll share a, a link now. It has all of the details that uh, I'm about to cover. Okay. So to start off, the U.S. economy officially entered a brief, sharp recession in February 2020. That recession probably officially ended sometime in the early summer. We don't know for sure just yet. But we would expect that uh, most of the impacts will not be contained to the official recession because of how it's defined, how it's constructed at a national level. Negative impacts grew increasingly concentrated among people of color, the leisure and hospitality sector, and small businesses. But there is reason to expect that the U.S. economy will see strong economic growth as conditions continue to improve. A stronger than expected rally in late 2020 in particular has encouraged private sector and government forecasters. There's gonna be some differences in how regions respond to this recovery, and those are really gonna be driven by longer term fundamentals like industry mix, education levels, and racial equity. So if you look at this chart, this is looking at cumulative uh, production growth here in the region. So, sorry, total non-farm employment. Um, 
And employment really, we saw record setting declines and record setting gains in 2020. So if we look at April of last year, really at the depths of the initial shock, we had shed approximately 711,000 jobs. That's about 17% of all employment in the region off of its holiday season peaks. Job markets stabilized somewhat over the summer as we all adapted to the public health conditions. Uh, but then the recovery weakened slightly with the onset of winter and the resurgence of the virus. So as a overall, we've seen relatively quick but faltering job growth. By January of this year, we had regained many of the jobs lost in 2020, but remained down about 7.8%. So we were around 8%, had 8% fewer jobs than we did from a year prior. Uh, that job gain has also lagged behind Midwestern and national averages. So we're, as I would think we would expect from our experience with the last recession, not quite keeping up with the national recovery overall. Of course, things are moving quickly. We've all seen how much progress the region has made in the last few weeks. And 2021, in the summer in particular, I think will show whether or not job markets continue to see a slow recovery or they begin to pick up speed. I also want to point out that you know, widespread unemployment with persistent disparities by income level, race and ethnicity geography is not unique to the Chicago region. Uh, most regions saw their worst unemployment levels last April, but they've also all begun to decline. So as of December here in the region, that was around 8.3%, and then in Chicago in January, it picked up to 8.9%. But that's down from, uh, say, Los Angeles, which had 11.5% unemployment. So this really is a, a national story. Next slide, please. Of course, we also know from research and lived experience that the U.S. job market operates on a last hired, first fired basis, where vulnerable populations are often the last to see real benefits of economic expansion and the first to feel the impact of the downturn. This is particularly true for those who live and work at the intersections of disadvantaged identities, that would be women of color or those with disabilities. Unfortunately, Gender and race breakdowns on unemployment are not available on a monthly basis at the local level. It's very difficult to, to track all of these big movements in the economy. But if we look at preliminary annual averages for Illinois, then across 2020, we see some pretty high numbers and some real disparities across different populations. So this is particularly true for those who are younger, total ages between 20 and 24, were around 18% last year then black men at 16.8%, women of color, and on down to white men with an unemployment rate of just 0.8%. Of course, we know that unemployment rates can obscure the number of people who are out of work. Many have been discouraged from looking for work or, or remaining in the labor force. Others had to provide child and family care, particularly as schools and daycares were forced to close. Others had to take furloughs or early retirement. And many were concerned about their, their risk of severe illness. Altogether, about approximately 137,000 people workers were working or looking for work here in the region. That's about 3.2% uh, down from a year before. In many cases, the pandemic may have worsened some existing trends statewide. Oh, oh sorry, we can go to the next slide. Illinois' labor force participation rate, that is you know, the share of workers who are either employed or looking for work, has been declining for several years. This is due to economic challenges and demographic shifts. Over the past decade, the state's working age population has grown by about 45,000, but the labor force participation rate has fallen from 66.9% in 2010 to around 62.7% in 2020. And part of that is the recession, of course, and part of it are longer term trends here in the region. These trends are also closely tied to long standing racial equity inequities in that restrict opportunity for black and Latino people in particular. And this is particularly concerning because Illinois' recovery may be slowed if we leave people or places on the sidelines. And it's really going to be thinking through uh, some of the options to, to making sure that these populations are able to get uh, back into the labor force uh, sooner rather than later. Next slide, please. This chart is a little uh, scary at first, but, but bear with me. Uh, job losses were also uneven across industries. 
metropolitan economies. So if you look in the upper right-hand corner, that bold box uh, right under the U.S. average, negative 5.9, that's the nationwide economy-wide average for a year-over-year -year job change. And everything else is sort of a heat map relative to that number. So those in, in that sort of yellow gold color have recovered faster and they have a better employment outcome. Those in blue have a worse job outcomes relative to that negative 5.9%. And what we can see is that Northeastern Illinois shed nearly one in three jobs in hospitality and leisure. Uh, so really thinking about those in-person services that have been hit hard during this pandemic. But it has fared better than some peer regions like New York or Los Angeles. There are a lot of reasons that can feed into this. I think in particular, uh, the, the pandemic has affected nearly every sector uh, in their early days, but then many were able to get back online uh, faster than others. And so the downturn became increasingly centered on in-person services, travel, restaurant, retail, the arts. And so metropolitan Chicago export-oriented industries have shielded it from some of these effects. We have the most diversified large U.S. metropolitan economy with our historic strengths in manufacturing, freight, business services, finance, marketing. That really ties us pretty closely to national trends overall. And previous research has shown that industry structure can amplify or mitigate the severity of a downturn. And so the diversity of our economy, the export orientation of it, how closely it, it reflects the national economy, those really help to tie us a little bit closer to national trends and some of our peers in New York and LA, but not quite as well as Houston. So far, all current indicators are that the economic, sorry, we can get back to the slides. Uh, all current indicators show that the economic downturn is not structural, but rather closely tied to the course of the virus. Consumer spending in Northeastern Illinois was down about 13.6% in mid-February uh, from a year before. The decline is most significant for those discretionary categories and purposes and services. So things like restaurants, entertainment, hospitality and travel like here. Other categories like transportation and retail have fared better than expected. And grocery stores actually saw an 11% uh, increase in household spending as more people cooked at home. The volatility in consumer spending has also fallen hardest on small businesses. We can go to the next slide. Uh, small businesses in particular tend to have smaller cash reserves for short-term and emergency expenses. Businesses have increasingly adapted online or takeout sales and federal supports like stimulus checks or expanded unemployment benefits have boosted uh, spending, particularly for lower income households. But small business revenues in the region are still about a third below the pre-pandemic levels. And those gray lines in the background, those represent the city of Chicago and the seven counties. Uh, it's a little hard to fit everything onto one chart without it getting too busy to look at. So just highlight the, the Illinois trend. But you can see that while they bounce around a lot, they all relatively look the same. And I just looked at the numbers again last night that have a little bit more recent data. And this has actually slipped slightly in the last few weeks. So uh, it seems that we have stabilized at a, at a poor condition uh, and we will have to put a little bit more effort into climbing back towards where uh, small business revenues were at the beginning of 2020. The drop in consumer demand, uh, and concern for personal and community well-being also required many small businesses to close. Next slide, please. About one in three small businesses across Northeastern Illinois remains closed. Uh, the data that we're using for this comes from Opportunity Insights, which is a research group at Harvard. Uh, they define uh, open businesses as being open if they've had a transaction in the last three days. So it's not quite clear if, if that's just business being slow or businesses have been closed. But either way, uh, it is concerning that about a third of small businesses uh, are not seeing much business. We also know this has had disproportionate impacts on black businesses, other groups who face structural disadvantages. And we're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of research in the next couple of years to see how government supports like business relief grants or emergency loans have helped to improve the situation some. Next 
So like job markets, conditions for small businesses remain impaired. Nearly half of small businesses in metropolitan Chicago reported that they would need more than six months to recover from the downturn. This is up slightly from 38% uh, in mid-April last year. So comparing those blue bars and the green bars. So we see a, a shift in where sort of business, small business sentiment is at the moment. And really, I think the overarching narrative here is that divergence over time. As the economy has stabilized and slowly improved, small businesses have either increasingly indicated greater confidence or greater concern about their ability to recover. So really sort of a, a shifting, a, a sifting out of, of businesses as they uh, work through their challenges. So one in five small businesses are reporting that they are operating at their normal pre-pandemic levels, which sort of shows, I think, the resilience that they that many small businesses have shown over the past year. Uh, of course, continued recovery depends first and foremost on tackling the virus itself. Again, going back to opportunity insights that I put Harvard, the indicators show that small business revenue and jobs were already declining before government restrictions came into place as consumers in particular changed their behavior in response to public health conditions and loss and this led to losses for lower income workers in particular who are commuting to retail and hospitality jobs in more affluent areas so as conditions improved in the summer and fall last year state ordered reopenings of the economies had fairly small effects and so it's going to be instead a, a question of when shoppers, diners, and tourists are going to feel more confident about returning in person. Overall, there is reason to believe that business activity in the job market will pick up this year. Industrial production is continuing to make significant progress, and manufacturers' new orders for core capital goods are at an all-time high. And of course, I'll speak for myself as I'm sitting here watching it snow in Andersonville, uh, there's a pent-up demand for all of us to get back to normal and, and try to get back to restaurants and, and entertainment venues safely. Looking at longer-term trends, however, there are some long-standing concerns here in the Chicago region that could hold us back. We entered the COVID-19 pandemic with a declining population and lagging economic growth. Research shows that natural disasters, social disturbances, these tend not to have a very large impact on well-developed economies like ours. They can be very severe for those who are impacted directly, but really long-term growth is more dependent on industry mix, educational attainment, racial equity, those long-term conditions and assets that are the deciders for growth. After substantial declines from the 2007-2009 Great Recession, the Chicago region recovered its production levels more slowly than our peers. And, you know, much of that growth had begun to slow and accelerate for regions across the country uh, in 2019. So really prior to the pandemic hitting, that decade long expansion is already beginning to slow down. Next slide, please. Uh, Northeast Illinois has significant assets that if fully tapped would allow it to outcompete peer regions economically. Uh, however, its recent performance has not lived up to this potential. Our export oriented industries have continued to decline as a share of the region's private employment. So if you think about those industries that are most likely to grow our economy, things that ship goods and services around the world, those jobs have declined from 42% of all jobs to 37%. So we have sort of a narrowing of our industry base over the last two decades. And this has also led to a decline in middle skill, middle wage jobs, particularly manufacturing jobs. Of course, we've shifted to a more service-based economy, but those job gains haven't totally made up for the loss of manufacturing jobs over the last two decades. The region will need to find other sources of talent-driven growth by drawing on a diverse and well-educated workforce. Next slide, please. Thanks. So nearly half, about 45% of residents here over the age of 25 have an associate's degree or higher. This is well above national average and is on par with our peers. This includes more than two and a half million residents with a bachelor's degree. So a very well-educated workforce, and that's really a hallmark here in the region. Uh, however, there are some headwinds, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Overall college enrollment in the state fell uh, for about 5% uh, for, for the fall semester. That is uh, about double the rate 
nationwide. And there are a number of trends that lead into that. There was a sharp decline in the number of first time freshman enrollment nationwide, particularly at public two year colleges. So the two year colleges saw a 20% sharp decline in new college enrollment last fall. So as we think about our community colleges in particular, what are some of the strategies that would be required to bring students back safely, to give them some assurances around in-person instruction, the affordability, the benefits of remote learning? How can we make sure that we are continuing to build out that well-educated workforce? The state's uh, deep human capital and historically low unemployment rates also helped to drive up median household incomes in the last few years. So between 2016 and 2019, household incomes rose 13%. That's some really meaningful gains for households that I think we've all been waiting for over the last few decades. There have been some broad challenges in the US economy that have held incomes flat for the last few decades. And we've seen some, some action, particularly at the Federal Reserve, to think about how they can redefine full employment and, and their sort of uh, historic priorities and policy objectives to think about how this recovery can not only be uh, meaningful in terms of employment, but also meaningful in terms of wage gains for, for workers across different populations. And so I think if you wanted to compare this recovery to the last one, I think wage gains and how to sort of, in a macroeconomic sense, help to drive those up is going to be a, a much heavier topic than the past. Of course, we know that this continued prosperity obscures deep, deep racial and ethnic inequality in the region. The typical black household earns just 46 cents for every dollar earned by the typical white household, and this has been true for many years, and it sort of hovers uh, there in the mid 40s, but it is a, a deep and uh, compounding disparity in, in like, income inequality here in the region. And we know that this the pandemic and this recession have likely worsened inequality, much like the Great Recession did a decade ago. Another jobless recovery like that following the last recession could hold back these re residents in particular, but we know that these disparities long predate the current crisis, and they're really the effect of discrimination, disinvestment, and segregation. So some of those longer-term trends that we highlighted in the 2050 plan and we continue to work on, as Jane pointed out earlier. And so it's really, I think, incumbent upon us to think about how economies limit their own potential when we fail to increase the availability of opportunity, and how, what are some of the structural reforms that we would need to make to ensure that opportunity is available to everyone in the region. With that, that's the end of my uh, sort of avalanche of data, but I'm happy to answer any questions or, or any comments. Do we have any questions? I'd just like to make an observation. Uh, out here in Batavia, I've got uh, six senior living communities where we have people living full time and in various sizes of, of complexes. I have one that's 40 acres and it has almost a thousand people. As a result of that, my, po my senior population up here is probably much higher than many other communities. But the one thing we found in the, the whole pandemic situation was, and I guess it spins into an economic impact, is, is that our senior citizen population has very, very little technology skill in many instances. There are some that are totally competent, but seemingly the, the vast majority of them are lacking in understanding uh, how to use technology. And I, the common line I get shot at me by these folks is, if you graduated from high school before 1970, you never saw a computer in any classroom you were ever in. And I think you know, knowing I was in school at that time myself, that that's probably true. But there's an economic impact, just to give you an idea of how this has all gone off the track here a little bit, is uh, we had a real crisis here when we started announcing we were gonna have the vaccine available. And none of my seniors seemed to have the ability to go online and register themselves for any shot locations. So fortunately, we had some private citizens who had the skills step forward, and we got most of them registered, but it was quite a to-do, and it was a lot of animosity flying around and everything else about what we were doing here, but it all worked out. But more interestingly, from a pure economic standpoint, we had 
Walgreens drugstore during the middle of this whole thing, make a decision as a corporation, they were going to uh, terminate the publication of their weekly sales brochure. Now, I didn't realize how many of my seniors were highly dependent on that brochure to know what was for sale at Walgreens. They had a, I'll call it, I had a protest stampede on me down here at City Hall about what I could do to get them the Walgreens app or the, the brochure back, and there wasn't anything I seemed to be able to do. So right at the moment, every Friday afternoon, my staff at the City of Batavia goes on the Walgreens uh, corporate page, and there's an app that has the brochure, but you have to go on the app to read it. Well, we take the app off and we print it up and we make copies of it. It's about 20 to 25 pages per issue. And then we make about 20 copies of that. And then we leave them at the front desk of our police station. And all these senior citizens start coming in on Saturday. And now we've told them we can't have, just keep making these all the time. So you got to share these. So they're doing it. But I mean, that's kind of the extreme of how this, this whole thing has had an impact on us. But such things as Walgreens not, pub Walgreens not publishing their app anymore has got the city of Batavia in the business of publishing them ourselves off their computer site and then distributing them to our residents because they don't have, our residents don't have the skill to do that themselves. Okay. So I only share that as kind of a unique way of how this thing has impacted us as a region. And uh, I, I think it goes a long way with what you're talking about, the economic impacts of the region. But the senior citizen population really is very weak when it comes to technology. At least that's my experience in Batavia. And when you tell them you're going to give them their answer via the computer in some form or fashion, many of them just stop dead in their tracks and say, can't do it, don't know how to use it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a challenge that the region, I think, probably has throughout the region if you start looking at it closely in other cities, too. So well, I think that's certainly true. I mean, many of the uh, forces that have sort of been shown over the past year haven't reversed trends in the economy, but really have accelerated them. I think last summer there was a lot of speculation about how COVID-19 would change everything. Just thinking about, well, no, not exactly. Many of these longer term trends will be accelerated, like the shift towards technology. And what are some of the services we would have to provide to support our public population? Yeah. So it's just it's just part of the unique story that the pandemic has brought upon us. But I, I really appreciate the efforts that you're making at, at CMAP to kind of keep a track on this thing and kind of put a roadmap in front of us as to how we can deal with this in the future. Because I think this is something that's not going to go away. So I appreciate your good efforts. Okay, let's move to nine, which is local government network update. Patrick Day. Thank you, Mayor. Since last report, through executive committee, the local government network has connected with municipalities to complete two initiatives focused on one regional priority. It was not publication of the uh, Walgreens uh, penny saver, uh, but we did take up another, uh, hopefully similarly uh, dynamic problem solving spirit of that, which is really kind of the spirit of what we're doing here. Um, we promoted newly available emergency rental assistance programs to help renters and landlords negatively impacted by the pandemic by paying up to 12 months months of unpaid rent and utilities for eligible citizens. First in March, the network supported Cook County when their rental assistance program opened, connecting with municipalities fully or partially located within Cook County to promote application submittals by their April 2nd deadline. And then in April, when Lake County opened their rental assistance program, on the 5th, we replicated the initiative to connect, to connect with municipalities in Lake County. Also of note, the network has begun fielding small scale requests for advisement that have been coming in from municipalities submitted to the network liaisons, who then connect the communities to the applicable CMAP subject matter experts for, for advice. Thus far, most requests have pertained to advisement on plan implementation strategy or follow-up questions on published policy research. Looking ahead, it is a near-term priority of the network to complete assessment of transition for staff and officials following this month's elections and to engage newly elected partners and appointed staff to ensure continuity on local and regional goals. 
any questions or comments on any of this, I'm happy to answer. Any questions or comments of Patrick? I guess not, so thank you very much. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Mayor. All right, moving to item 10, which is the legislative update by Gordon Smith. So I, I think uh, I'll be going first for the, the federal side. Uh, good morning, Mayor. My name is Tim McMahon. I work on our federal government affairs uh, within our plan implementation and legislative affairs team here at CMAP. Uh, and I'll just take a few minutes and uh, tell you what we've been looking at and monitoring at the federal level. Um, so obviously, we uh, are keeping a very close eye on surface transportation reauthorization. Um, that process is, is really getting going. Two of the main authorizing committees held hearings last week. The Senate Banking held its hearing on the public transit section uh, portion of the bill. And then the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, uh, usually the committee that leads the reauthorization process in the Senate, held a hearing around funding uncertainty um, around federal highway programs. Uh, after that hearing, the chair of that committee indicated that he would like a bipartisan, fully funded bill. Um, having said that, there is still no indication how the House and Senate committees that actually cover the revenues portion of a transportation bill uh, would like to pay for that. Um, on the House side, as Erin mentioned in her report, we are also tracking the potential return of earmarks through the member designated projects process. Uh, and we've been in regular contact with our congressional committees uh, and staff about that. Um, and the House TNI committee deadline for those projects is this Friday, April 23rd. Uh, but for most delegation partners, their internal deadline was likely has likely already passed, um, so they had time to review and submit those projects. Uh, I also want to make you aware that we've been tracking a separate earmark process through the House Appropriations Committee. Um, that some or many of you may be aware of. Those projects are called community projects funding. Uh, eligibility for those projects is a bit broader than the transportation committee ones and includes funding for stormwater planning grants, drinking water infrastructure grants, workforce training, economic development, um, housing, as well as local transportation projects. Uh, the committee deadline for those projects is at the end of next week, uh, but similar to the transportation, process. Uh, most of our delegation members had their deadlines for those projects on April 9th, earlier this month. So for both the transportation projects and the earmark uh, appropriations projects, House Republicans have indicated that they are support of the return of this process. However, the Senate still has not come to an agreement on whether to bring back this actual earmark process in their chamber. Uh, that decision should be coming soon. I know I read yesterday Senate Republicans are uh, potentially going to vote on that within their caucus tomorrow. So, so we should know more. Um, and, and they need to decide soon to keep up with their end of May uh, timeline for the draft bill that congressional Democrats have talked about. So, so like I said, Congress is still at the beginning stages of the reauthorization process. Uh, it's still unclear how it will interact with the administration's recently proposed 2.3 trillion American jobs plan, which includes significant investments in roads, transit, uh, green energy, regional economic development, and then other uh, forms of infrastructure. Uh, the administration has presented this jobs plan proposal as additional funding to current spending rather than uh, you know, their surface transportation reauthorization bill. Um, so congressional Democrats have said that they are hoping to have an initial bill drafted by the end of May. Uh, and the Speaker of the House has said she would like to have something infrastructure related pass the House by July 4th. Uh, so it's still unclear whether that will be the jobs plan, some form of surface transportation reauthorization, or a mix of both. If Congressional Democrats decide to use the budget reconciliation process, which is the same process they used for the American Rescue Plan um, in March, then surface transportation reauthorization would likely be considered separately um, from the jobs plan and through the regular committee process ahead of the fast acts ex expiration on september 30th 2021 so that is my report i'm happy to take any any questions anyone may have uh if not I, i'll turn it over to anthony for the state uh report any questions of tim 
Yeah, I guess we'll switch then to Anthony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. My name is Anthony Safali. I work for Gordon here in the Government Affairs Group at CMAP. Um, just a very brief state update, because as you know, a number of deadlines have been shifted uh, for the General Assembly. Uh, the deadline for legislation to leave their chamber of origin is actually coming up, and that's a big deal because a number of bills that CMAP has been tracking will fall off the list at that point. Um, budget discussions have begun in earnest. Uh, IDOT testified last week to talk about their proposed appropriation. Um, and these, these hearings will continue through Memorial Day when session ends. Um, just a quick FYI for this group, uh, the CMAP board is supporting a number of pieces of legislation. Um, we are looking very specifically at the Cook County Assessor's Bill to require property tax, property tax data to be disclosed. Uh, this is an initiative that the Assessor has filed in the past and the CMAP board has supported in the past. Um, other initiatives include the State Treasurer's Infrastructure Finance Initiative, as well as the uh, uh, proposal to eliminate the local contribution requirement for IDOT for bicycle and pedestrian facilities. I would be happy to take any questions that you have, and of course, feel free to reach out with any federal questions as well, since Tim is on the line. Any questions of Anthony or Tim? It's all quiet on the Western Front today here, so. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll go to item number 11, which is uh, other business. Do we have any other business to come up? Okay. Uh, do we have any public comment? Did anybody file any comments prior to today's meeting for staff to meet or? No, no, Mayor Schalke, we haven't had any public comments, uh, haven't popped up, and we did not have any prior to the meeting. And I've been kind of advised here that we never did get the quorum in the meeting, so it's a good thing we didn't have any key votes today because we were kind of wasting our time there. Um, yeah, so Mary, go ahead. You can. Oh, sure. So, no, Mayor Schalke, we don't have a quorum. Um, but we do want to acknowledge that Mayor Kearns and Mayor Sherwin joined the meeting. Okay. Thank them for coming. Okay. Uh, anybody, anybody on the council have any last comments they'd like to make for the meeting before we adjourn? All right. I'm told here that our, our next uh, Council of Mayors Executive Committee is scheduled for July 20th. And, uh, Obviously, we'll be in contact with you to tell you the format of that and how we're going to do it. Uh, and by then, we'll have some new members and uh, we may have to, hopefully, we'll have a quorum because we may have to put some people into various positions. So I appreciate everybody's understanding relative to that. Uh, I guess there being no further business, I will adjourn the meeting. I look forward to seeing everybody in July and I thank all of you who did participate today. Uh, I think some of the staff reports were very instrumental and informative, and I appreciate their good efforts. So thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, all.